This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Patients in need of medical advice should consult their personal health care provider. From UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, welcome to That's Pediatrics. I'm one of your hosts, John Williams, Chief of Pediatric Infectious Diseases and Director of the Institute for Infection, Inflammation, and Immunity in Children, or I4Kids. And I'm Steph Dewar, Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs, Director of the Pediatric Residency Training Program, and a member of the Pediatric Hospital Medicine Group. We're here today with Dr. Stacy Cook, who's an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of General Academic Pediatrics, and she's the director of our Complex Care Clinic. Welcome, Stacy. Thanks for having me. Well, we're happy to have you here because the Complex Care Clinic, I think, is something that maybe a lot of listeners don't know about. Could you tell us a little bit about what the work is that you're doing there? Absolutely. We opened in July of 2017, and we serve as a medical home, meaning like the central point of contact for children who have significant medical complexity. So they have to have about three or four chronic active medical conditions, and we require that they have technology dependence. We are pretty generous about that. You can have a G-tube, it could be a wheelchair, but you have some sort of technology dependence to assist for activities of daily living. So it's interesting that this is... um a group of pediatric patients that maybe folks aren't aware of. What type of numbers of patients are we talking about? That's such a good question because I, I think in so many respects, uh, most people think of pediatrics, they think of you know asthma, well child care, but a significant portion of the pediatric population, especially the ones that are in the hospital, actually happen to be kids like this with technology dependence. And we think if you, depending on your definition of it, it can make up like five to 15% of the pediatric population. But the truth is, is that these kids make up a disproportionate amount of our hospital admissions, our ER visits, all that kind of thing. And so there's been a big movement, I would say, in the last 10 to 15 years to really try to centralize and help these families navigate these very complicated medical systems. And that's where the uh, standard of care has really moved towards having a medical home like the Complex Care Center. So believe it or not, we were a little late to the game. This was um, around in a lot of other institutions um, as a clinic where these children could go and have pediatrician that weren't intimidated by a lot of those kind of chronic medical needs. Well, that's a question I had about the pediatricians who were intimidated by this. When, when Steph and I were young doctors, which was just a few years ago, uh, there were often a few of the general pediatricians in the community or here at UPMC Children's that would take care of these kids. So are there more of these children now, or are community pediatricians just less comfortable caring for them And that's why they need you and your colleagues. Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think, you know, we've done such a fantastic job with our NICU population and our little premature babies that we're certainly seeing a large cohort of children that may not have survived into early, late childhood that are now there. So I think that that does increase the numbers. But I think as our healthcare landscape changes, too, our primary pediatricians in the community are getting more and more pressure to see more and more patients, to do it all different times of the day, and to have a child who has multiple medical needs with a chronic complex condition and fit that into a 15 minute visit just isn't realistic. And so they need help. And so we kind of, when we put our clinic together, we said we want to help them as well as help the families because this just isn't a realistic model for these children to get served in. And a lot of times due to kind of fragmentation in our healthcare systems, it's hard for them to communicate. So unless they have, you know, instant <laughs> um, communication with the main hospital, that really puts a burden on them. Not only is the visit long, but it could take them two, three days to figure out who to contact. And so that was kind of, I always say we weren't smarter than anybody else. We just happened to be physically here <laughs> and we could, we know how to find you guys. Well, and I think you've recognized that not only is it about the physician, but it's about the other support staff that you have working with oh, you to absolutely. assist the families. Yeah, the model of um, a medical home really kind of um, 
runs on a foundation of what we call like, you know, enhanced care coordination, meaning that your nurses, your administrators, everybody's kind of on the same page. This is, these kids can get sick. They can get sick fast. These poor families are often on the phone all day. They're coming in and out of the hospital. So everybody's got to understand that we've got to do what we can to help these families out. And so it's really a team effort. And you have to have people that can work together and communicate together very efficiently. Um, and so we've been really lucky with that. As I said, my our nurse coordinator, our administrative assistant, and our care managers, um, they're phenomenal. And they do an amazing job for the families. But you have to have that. Because really, the doctors are probably the least important in the part of the group. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you follow these children as outpatients and inpatient. And it sounds like your group is also sort of like case managers for these children. Yes, we primarily our role because PHM does such a fantastic job in patient. We try we're fill, we're trying to fill that that gap, if you will, um, in the outpatient setting. So that's where we kind of focus most of our attention. We try to lend a hand when we can if we have something significant going on upstairs. If there's a chronic issue that we can kind of um, put our two cents in. But I think everybody um, is used to getting phone calls from us, and we all have each other's cell phones, and we communicate via Cerner, so we can communicate pretty seamlessly, but come up when necessary. But most of the time, we're taking care of them on the outpatient setting and trying to kind of give them that soft landing when they come out. You know, especially if the hospitalization brought on new diagnoses, new equipment, new medicines, that kind of stuff's really overwhelming for a family to have that stuff kind of just happen um, when they weren't exposed to it before. So you mentioned that um, while it's a small percentage of the pediatric population, actually the group of patients that you care for, it's common for them to require hospitalization. I'm wondering what metrics or what efforts you're making to assist with that. Yeah, be, since we're such a new service and we have such a focus on the outpatient setting, we, we, are, we have been wondering just what brings these kids into the ER? Are there things that we can do to keep them home? Are things that we can do to keep them from having to come in? Even if they come to the ER, can we keep them from having to get admitted? Because by and large, these families will tell you they want to be home. And really, you know, Pennsylvania, we're pretty rural once you get out of Allegheny County. And so for some of our families, they're driving a great distance. Weather's an issue during different seasons of the year. And they have other kids at home. And so being stuck here is really not ideal for them. And that's not what they want to do. So we have really kind of focused on what brings them to the ER. Um, when do they come to the ER? Is there seasonality to it? What's the chief complaints? How often are they doing it? Do they call us before they come? So we're really looking to try to pick apart what what is that about. And then we're also looking again at the hospitalizations. What kind of hospitalization and how long are they there? Um, we ha One of the things that we offer that I think has been incredibly helpful is that our providers are on call for them 24-7. So they can page one of the four main providers in clinic. And really, because of the way we do our clinic model, most of us get to know the very active kids. And so it's actually very nice because then they can get at least someone who knows them. So a lot of times we can save them from coming in. And sometimes we say, oh, you got to come in. You're pretty sick. Well, so that's what I wondered is how often that works. Like Steph, we've cared for a lot of these children in the hospital. And of course, we're happy to have them here. But like you said, the family often doesn't want to be here. And sometimes the child really isn't that sick and the family could manage at home. So how successful have you been at kind of making that transition to let the families manage the way they want to at home? That's a great question. And we've seen a lot of really interesting interventions that we think have worked. Our, um, we just were able to put together our first kind of traditional quality improvement run chart, and we now have 11 points um, below the mean. So we've seen a significant um, decrease in emergency room visits just since we opened. Um, when we look at how they use the, the emergency room over months of enrollment, the longer you're enrolled with us, the less you go is what we see. And, you know, it can be as simple as one of the things that just blew my mind when we first opened was, you know, if a kid has a, a jejunostomy tube, you know, we put those in through interventional radiology. Um, our kids, if it got clogged or got pulled, they would just come straight to the ER. But many of those kids have Mickey buttons at home. And so if they can tolerate just even Pedialyte overnight, they don't have hypoglycemia, for instance. We have them pop in the old Mickey button, give them some Pedialyte. I usually email right after I hang up the phone, the IR scheduler, 
eight o'clock in the morning because that woman is never late. She calls me and she says, let's put them on for 130. And there we've avoided an emergency room presentation and an admission just by doing that. And that was like the first thing we noticed. Feeding intolerance is a huge one that I think we really hopefully have intervened on. You know, many kids do not tolerate G feeds or even J feeds all the time. And there's, I always say to people, well, there's no 100% tolerance, right? Um, and so they have, you know, a day or so where they're just not, they're a little distended, they're not doing as well, maybe they're having some spitting up. You know, we just have the mechanism for kind of intervening there, saying, let's just do some PDLA, let's give them a break. Many of those kids do fine, they never have to come in, never. And then actually the, the, the interesting thing is a lot of it's just general peds. He has a cold and he has a fever. What do I do? And even though they have a trach, I mean, of course, we have to think of things more co- in a more complicated, comprehensive way, but still, a lot of times, it's just supportive care. So how do most patients find your services? Well, you know, we wanted, we knew we were new, new team, new systems, new processes. So I got the best advice I probably got in the whole process from um, Basil Zatelli. It was like, go slow. <laughs> so we started slow. We changed a lot of our, we changed our notes. We changed our care coordination processes. Those things in the first year, we went from like zero to about 150 patients. And so we did not advertise and we took that all from internal referrals. We now have probably about 50-50 mix from parent word of mouth to um, also still internal referrals or even community pediatrician are referring. So now we have about 610 enrolled patients, um, and we've seen about 750 unique patients. But many, the, the difference in that number just reflects the fact that they got better and we kind of transitioned them back out to their community pediatrician. But what a difference in these families' lives to be able to be managed at home and either not be in the hospital or even not have to come to the ER. And we've all been in the ER. I mean, our ER is terrific, but boy, it gets busy in the winter and you might sit there for a long time. Right. And I think exposing these kids to some of the germs that are there is really, really, it, to come into the ER in the middle of flu season for a J-tube replacement and expose yourself to the flu, RSV, whatever, I think is just a crime. And that's really what we're really trying to is just apply just some common sense approaches. The thing that's been really gratifying, I find, is that I think a lot of families, they know that we'll keep, they know we're trying. So when we say it's time, they're pretty respectful about it. And I think that it feels like, okay, we did what we could here. And I think for them sometimes that that's just all they needed because they wear so much of that burden when they come in. They feel like, should I have done this? Should I have not? Just even talking it through. I mean, every once in a while, we'll get a page from somebody who's just genuinely sick and I'm thinking, oh my God, we're going to call EMS, right? But I think they just needed to spend two and a half minutes with us talking it out and knowing that they weren't crazy. I That's probably one of the things that makes me happiest when we take page or call because I the outcome may not have changed, but I feel like we gave them the confidence to know that the decision they made was right because they're upending their families to come in. You know, they're dropping kids off at a neighbor or doing crazy things to make it work. So this is a very interesting little niche of pediatrics. I'm wondering what led you to medicine, pediatrics, and this complex care service? Um, gosh, <laughs> I'm getting old enough that I have to to remember it's um you know it's really we actually, understand that. it's actually <laughs> yes it's actually kind of a sad story I um was finishing my chief resident year and I was going to be a hospitalist in Boston and Steve Parker who some people that may listen to this may remember he was a developmental pediatrician in Boston and he ran a home-based program a medical home and it, he did a lot he was kind of like a neurologist child development general pediatrician jack of all trades and he used to take a social worker a care coordinator and he would go out and visit people in their homes and he did this at Boston Medical Center for 30 years um, and he had patients who then had babies who had needs. And I mean, he had taken care of generations. Mm. Um, And poor Steve uh, passed away suddenly. Um, I want to say it was May of 2008 now. And kind of it upended really that service there because these families were just, I mean, really devastated and they needed somebody. And, you know, it's kind of sad to say, but, you know, young pediatricians aren't super interested in this population. I think because the problems are a little messy and they're hard and that's always intimidating. And they were having difficulty finding someone who would step into the clinic. And so they kind of asked me to do it. And um, it was just, it was mind blowing. I really, 
I really just grew to love the population. And when I came down here, I'm grateful. I did mostly primary care for about five years, and I really needed it, let me tell you. I had done so much inpatient work. I really, I, I needed the, I needed the primary care. So that was very helpful. And then I think, as you guys know, I started rotating a little bit with PHM, started talking to Dr. Zatelli, um, Christina Emming, who's my partner in complex care, was really passionate. And we just kind of put a business plan together and went for it. And so that's how we landed here. And I always kind of say I've been kind of in fellowship now for three years. <laughs> There's no complex care fellowship yet, but it feels like one. Um, so it's been, but it's been a blast. It's been great. And we just love our families. Well, it's a really different, uh, you know, to hear you talk about it. I can see the the appeal of it and appreciate your passion. It is a little different than a lot of pediatricians or a lot of people that get into pediatrics like the fact that most kids are healthy. They have an acute problem. You fix it and then they go on their way. Whereas, you know, what you're describing is a little more like our colleagues who went into internal medicine, you know, because you're managing chronic illnesses and long-term problems. And that's just as important, but some of us who are more superficial, uh, you know, need the, the, the quick gratification of, okay, I fixed that problem instead of long-term management. Uh, well, many of our kids can't talk to us, and I think that's really intimidating because our patients can't come out and say. But I think what's been so lovely is to see them well and see these lives. They, they lead really rich, beautiful lives, and their families are, are full of joy, and they do so much to advocate for them. And it's just – it's amazing. Their kids are resilient. I mean, they get better, and they do great things. I, I, I'm i partial. I'm not going to lie. I'm partial to the babies. I love seeing these NICU families come out, and they're all a little bit – all a little bit weary and then you know you're a year into it and you can see them they're you know they're taking vacations they're going to the beach they're calling about what sunscreen to use as opposed to what to do with the g-tube and that's that's a blast yeah i have to say um as a hospitalist having interacted with many um families and patients it's it's so remarkable to me to recognize the energy and persistence that goes into caring for some of our patients and and the stress that these uh, families experience. And and to be honest, the hospital system causes a lot of their roadblocks and frustrations. And so it's so helpful to have the complex care clinic because I know that we can transition them to the outpatient setting and have um, you, you folks pick that up with them to help them navigate what we don't always make a very navigable situation. Well, parenting's hard, and I, they, these people are warriors. They always, they, they're superheroes. They really are. So what is next for you in the complex care group? Well, we have a couple initiatives we're thinking about. I, we're digging a little bit more into social determinants of health for our, our families. And so we have uh, partnered a little bit with the food insecurity team and um, Lyft, actually, via the United Way. So we're doing... Um, we're doing some piloting to engage families in what they think about ride sharing services. I mean, this is so new. We just want to know what they think about it. Um, so, and we're doing food insecurity screening, transportation screening. So that was new for us this year. And it was due. We were due for that. We really need to also engage the families in more of an advisory panel. That's one of the things we just hadn't gotten to yet. And then we're trying to think hard about different ways of modeling care. So one of the things I feel kind of like very passionate about is thinking about post-NICU and is there ways to do that different? Do we need to really bring these children in 14 to 16 times in the six weeks after they've been in the hospital for 15 months? I mean, it, it just makes no sense. And so we partner really closely with the um, UPMC for You and the UPMC Health Plan. And so we've been um, talking about ways that we could think about doing some pilot studies with some really significantly sick children to try to keep them at home for, let's say, 60 to 90 days with either home-based services um, and a program like ours where we could take care of the medications, the equipment, um, the weights, and communication with the subspecialist. So that during RSV season, we're not dragging a vented ex preemie back to Lawrenceville six times. I mean, that just makes no sense to me. So that's one of the things I probably feel the most passionate about going forward at the moment. So you're, you're describing, it's like telemedicine or app, app-based sort of interactions with families? I think so, but you know, I always say I love telemedicine, it's great, but you don't need a telemedicine suite to do it. Like there's email, there's a phone, you know, there's like so much that we do with just traditional communication methods and that we don't, you know, 
have to get a big piece of equipment or give them an iPad. Like you can just, you know, FaceTime them. It's pretty awesome. So, I mean, I'm trying to use some of those things so that we can do it quickly as opposed to waiting for resources and um, allocation of those resources, which I think hold things up. Well, Dr. Cook, thank you so much for being our guest. It's really fascinating to hear about all the great work you and your team are doing in the complex care clinic. Yes, and once again, I mean, as a member of the hospitalist division, I, I'm so thankful that we have you here to help us, you know, partner with us to care for these patients and families. Oh, thank you for having me today. You can find other episodes of That's Pediatrics on iTunes, Google Play Music, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to keep up with new content. Leave us a review and tell us what other topics you'd like our experts to cover. Thanks for listening.